Hello and welcome to another installment of training from HUD's Office of Public and Indian Housing on the Housing Opportunity Through Modernization Act of 2016, also known as HOTMA. This deep dive training series on HOTMA provides a closer examination of multiple important topics in the statute and final rule implementing sections 102, 103, and 104 of the law. This training will focus on the asset limitation on eligibility introduced in HOTMA. My name is Dan Three. I work in the Office of Public Housing Programs here at HUD. The discussion today will largely follow the guidance provided in Notice PIH 2023-27, Attachment A, on the asset limitation. We will start with a quick overview of the asset limitation and then discuss the differences between admission and re-examination. While PHAs have no discretion as to how they enforce the asset limitation at admission, there are discretionary policy options at re-examination that PHAs will need to consider. We will provide an overview of PHAs' ability to adopt total non-enforcement policies at re-examination, enforcement policies, limited enforcement policies, and exception policies. After explaining these options, we will take some time to discuss the two discrete criteria for the asset limitation in further detail. First, we will discuss the limitation on net family assets or the net family assets threshold. Following that, we will discuss the limitation on real property ownership, including exemptions to that prohibition and the provisos on real property ownership related to the legal right to reside in the property, the effective legal authority to sell the property, and the suitability of the real property for occupancy. Nearing the end of our agenda, we will discuss what termination of assistance would mean for each program, and we will review what PHAs need to establish in a written policy on the asset limitation. First, a quick overview. Section 104 of HOTMA introduces a limitation on eligibility for assistance based on assets. The asset limitation applies to public housing, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, Section 8 Project-Based Vouchers, Section 8 Moderate Rehabilitation or Moderate Rehabilitation SRO, including moving to work agencies, and Section 8 Project-Based Rental Assistance. It prohibits a dwelling unit assisted under the Housing Act of 1937 from being rented or assistance under the Housing Act of 1937 from being provided to either initially or at each recertification of family income to any family who has either net family assets in excess of $100,000, or to a family who has a present ownership interest in a legal right to reside in and the effective legal authority to sell real property that is suitable for occupancy by the family. There's a lot that needs to be unpacked in that prohibition. First, just note that there are two distinct elements to the asset limitation, the limit on net family assets, and the criterion that the family not have real property ownership interests of a certain kind. The $100,000 asset limit will be adjusted annually for inflation, and the new limit will be published online at HUD user for the coming calendar year. The asset limitation will apply to all new applicants once the PHA is complying with HOTMA. Depending on the discretionary policy a PHA adopts regarding re-examinations, the asset limitation may also apply to all current participants. PHAs have discretion whether to enforce the asset limitation at re-examinations. They can choose not to enforce at all, to enforce it, or to enforce it only after allowing families an opportunity to cure non-compliance. They may also establish exceptions to the asset limitation at re-examination. We will discuss all these options momentarily. The asset limitation is found in the Code of Federal Regulations at 24 CFR 5.618. Let's take a moment to examine the language at the outset of 5618. A dwelling unit in the public housing program may not be rented, and assistance under the Section 8 tenant-based and project-based programs may not be provided, either initially or upon re-examination of family income, to any family if the family's net assets, as defined in 5603, exceed $100,000, which amount will be adjusted annually by HUD in accordance with the Consumer Price Index for Urban Wage Earners and Clerical Workers, or 
the family has a present ownership interest in, a legal right to reside in, and the effective legal authority to sell based on state or local laws of the jurisdiction where the property is located, real property that is suitable for occupancy by the family as a residence. Except this real property restriction does not apply to, now as you can see at the end of this section of the regulation, 5618 goes on to enumerate a number of exemptions to the real property component of the asset limitation. We will go through these exemptions in a moment. For now, just note that the asset limitation is initially defined in terms of those two separate criteria. This provides us a brief overview of the asset limitation. We will return to say more about those two separate criteria in a moment. First, though, let's examine the differences between the asset limitation at admission and at re-examination. At admission, PHAs have no discretion and must enforce the asset limitation. If an applicant's net family assets exceed $100,000 or the inflation adjusted level of net family assets for that year, the PHA may not admit them. If the family has a present ownership interest in real property and none of the reasons for exempting the property from the real property restriction applies, then the PHA may not admit the family. In this circumstance, denial of assistance is mandatory. At annual or interim re-examinations, PHAs have a decision to make about how they will enforce the asset limitation and need to adopt a written policy to inform program participants about what to expect. Before diving into the options PHAs have at re-examination, let's take a brief look at the regulatory language at 24 CFR 5618C that governs these options. Paragraph C1 provides that a PHA may choose not to enforce the restrictions of the asset limitation or may establish exceptions when they are recertifying income. This language mirrors the statute, which is what dictates why PHAs only have such discretion at re-examination. Paragraph C2 further specifies that PHAs must adopt a policy if they choose not to enforce or to establish exceptions. That is to say, paragraph C2 does not permit them to choose not to enforce at admissions. Again, at admission, enforcement of the asset limitation is mandatory. Finally, paragraph C3 copies from the statute language on possible criteria that could be used in an exception policy should the PHA choose to adopt one. We will return to that discussion momentarily. No matter what other policies they do or do not adopt, PHAs may delay initiating termination or eviction proceedings for non-compliant families for up to six months from the effective date of the re-examination. If participant families will be examined for compliance with the asset limitation at re-examination and they are found to be out of compliance, then the PHA may wait up to six months from the effective date of that re-examination before beginning the termination process. Note that that does not mean that they must have the termination process completed by the six month mark. This instead refers to when the entire process must be initiated. For re-examinations, PHAs may adopt a written total non-enforcement policy, an enforcement policy, or a limited enforcement policy. They may also combine enforcement or limited enforcement policies with exception policies, which we will discuss. At annual and interim re-examinations, PHAs may choose not to enforce the asset limitation. If the PHA adopts a total non-enforcement policy, that means that the PHA will not initiate termination or eviction proceedings for any family identified as being out of compliance with the asset limitation at an annual or interim re-examination. Families who do not meet the requirements of the asset limitation will continue to be program participants and will continue to receive assistance. If a PHA adopts a total non-enforcement policy, 
that policy must be applied the same for all families. For example, if the PHA adopts a total non-enforcement policy in their admissions and continued occupancy policy, the no participant family in the public housing program will be subject to termination of tenancy because of non-compliance with the asset limitation. If your PHA elects to adopt a total non-enforcement policy, then at all income re-examinations, if you find that a family has more than $100,000 in net family assets, or that they own what would be disqualifying real property, that has no effect on the family's continued eligibility. PHAs must still calculate net family assets as defined in 24 CFR 5603, since that is part of calculating annual income. That means, among other things, that you must still determine the total value of net family assets and whether a family owns real property, since that real property may be included in net family assets as defined by 24 CFR 5603. PHAs still have to impute asset income on assets if net family assets exceed $50,000 as adjusted for inflation and income on a particular asset cannot be calculated. So these determinations may make a difference to income and rent calculations. However, if your PHA has adopted a total non-enforcement policy, there are certain questions that are now immaterial or irrelevant and do not need to be obtained. Questions about real property not relevant to determining the value of net family assets and which would only be relevant to determining whether the family qualifies for an exemption from the real property restriction of the asset limitation, no longer need to be asked. For instance, a PHA does not need to inquire about whether any real property the family owns is suitable for occupancy by the family as a residence. They do not need to inquire about whether the family has a legal right to reside in any real property that they own. There is a specific exclusion from net family assets of the value of any real property that the family does not have the effective legal authority to sell. So this is still pertinent to determining whether real property belongs in net family assets. If by contrast, a PHA adopts a written policy providing that they will enforce the asset limitation at re-examination, then they must determine at every re-examination annual or interim, whether a participant family is currently out of compliance with the asset limitation. That requires checking both the value of the family's net family assets and the nature of any real property ownership. If a family is determined to be out of compliance, the PHA may not delay initiation of termination or eviction proceedings for more than six months from the effective date of the re-examination and the family's participation in the program must be terminated. If the PHA is enforcing the asset limitation, current participants would be examined for compliance with the asset limitation at their first income re-examination after the effective date of HOTMA once the PHA is complying with HOTMA requirements. PHAs are not under an obligation to perform a new income re-examination just to determine current participants' compliance as soon as the PHA is implementing HOTMA. Nor may a PHA check a family for compliance with this HOTMA policy prior to the HOTMA effective date and the date the PHA begins complying in full with HOTMA policies. Compliance will be assessed as families come up for income re-examinations at their first annual or interim income re-examination, whichever comes first. An enforcement policy applies to all families in the program unless the PHA also adopts an exception policy discussed momentarily that applies total non-enforcement to some families or which provides some families an alternative limited enforcement policy. The third option a PHA may adopt is a limited enforcement policy. If the PHA adopts a limited enforcement written policy, then the PHA must determine at every re-examination, annual or interim, whether a participant family is currently out of compliance with the asset limitation. 
What distinguishes a limited enforcement policy from an enforcement policy is that when families are found out of compliance with the asset limitation at re-examination, then those families will be given an opportunity to cure non-compliance with the asset limitation. That is, the family will have some period of time after the determination, a cure period, to dispose of disqualifying real property ownership or to adjust their assets so that their net family assets no longer exceed $100,000 as adjusted. In their written policy, the PHA will specify a period of time, up to but no longer than six months, in which the family is given an opportunity to demonstrate that they are no longer out of compliance with the asset limitation. If the family demonstrates that they have cured their non-compliance, then the PHA will not initiate termination or eviction proceedings. If the family does not demonstrate that they have cured non-compliance, then the PHA must initiate termination or eviction proceedings. A limited enforcement policy applies to all families in the program, unless the PHA also adopts an exception policy, discussed momentarily, that applies total non-enforcement to some families, or which provides some families an alternative limited enforcement policy. PHAs may choose to allow all families less than six months to cure their non-compliance. The period of time they will allow, the cure period, needs to be specified in a written policy. A limited enforcement policy may not allow families more than six months to cure non-compliance, and the opportunity to cure does not extend the maximum window of time before uh, which a PHA must initiate termination or eviction proceedings for a non-compliant family. That is to say, whether or not the PHA adopts a limited enforcement policy, they may not delay the initiation of termination or eviction proceedings for non-compliant families by more than six months. Let's discuss some examples of limited enforcement policies. PHA A adopts a written limited enforcement policy that provides all families a cure period of six months from the effective date of the re-examination to demonstrate that they have cured non-compliance. If the family has not cured non-compliance by the end of that period, the PHA must initiate eviction or termination proceedings. If the effective date of the re-examination is January 1, then the family must demonstrate they have cured by July 1, and if they have not demonstrated that they have cured, the PHA may not delay the initiation of termination proceedings beyond July 1. PHA B adopts a written limited enforcement policy that provides all families a cure period of five months from the effective date of the re-examination to demonstrate that they have cured non-compliance. If the family has not cured non-compliance by the end of the five-month period, then the PHA must initiate eviction or termination proceedings no later than six months after the re-examination at which non-compliance was determined. If the effective date of the re-examination is January 1, then the family must demonstrate that they have cured by June 1. And if they have not demonstrated that they have cured, the PHA may not delay the initiation of termination proceedings beyond July 1. Note that even if a PHA adopts an enforcement policy and not a limited enforcement policy, the PHA may still delay the initiation of eviction or termination proceedings up to six months from the re-examination at which non-compliance was determined. Suppose that PHA C does not adopt a limited enforcement policy, but instead adopts a full enforcement policy. If the effective date of the re-examination is January 1, then the PHA may not delay the initiation of termination proceedings beyond July 1. One natural question at this point is what it means to cure non-compliance with the asset limitation, or how a family could demonstrate that they have cured. We'll come back to this topic after we've introduced a final option that PHAs may take, to adopt exception policies to the asset limitation at re-examination. An exception policy identifies a category or categories of families who will be provided a different policy than all other families in the program when it comes to the enforcement of the asset limitation at re-examination.
exception policies are only relevant to re-examination. They cannot make a difference to the fact that the asset limitation must be enforced for all applicants. An exception policy provides to families in the exception category or categories either total non-enforcement or a limited enforcement policy. So if the PHA generally adopts an enforcement policy or a limited enforcement policy for all families in its programs, the exception policy will mean that either that the families in the exception category will not be subject to enforcement of the asset limitation at all, or that they will be provided a longer cure period. As with the limited enforcement policy, the cure period for an exception policy may not exceed six months. You may be asking at this point, what are possible categories for an exception policy? The statute holds that eligibility criteria for establishing exceptions may provide for separate treatment based on family type and may be based on different factors such as age, disability, income, the ability of the family to find suitable alternative housing, and whether supportive services are being provided. That said, all exception policies must conform with fair housing statutes and regulations. Additionally, it's worth noting that whether or not PHAs adopt exception policies, they must comply with federal fair housing and civil rights requirements. If families, including a person with disabilities, need a reasonable accommodation, for example, for a longer cure period, given the difficulty of providing sufficient evidence of curing, and there is a nexus between that person's need and the disability, the fact that the PHA has not adopted an exception policy does not permit the PHA to ignore that request. Let's discuss some examples of exception policies. On the first row of this table on this slide, we have two possible exception policies. Below each, we show how an exception policy may be combined with a limited enforcement or an enforcement policy for all families not in the exception categories. PHAA adopts a written exception policy that provides that for all families who meet the definition of extremely low income at re-examination and are determined to be out of compliance with the asset limitation, PHAA will not enforce the asset limitation. Those families will not be subject to termination or eviction proceedings due to non-compliance at re-examination. Alongside this exception policy, PHAA could adopt a limited enforcement policy for all other families. Since the family in the exception category is receiving a total non-enforcement policy, PHAA could set this limited enforcement policy cure period for all other families at any level up to but not to exceed six months. In this particular example, the PHA sets a limited enforcement policy for all other families with a cure period of six months. Alternatively, PHAA could elect to adopt an enforcement policy for all other families. For any families not in the exception category, if they are determined to be out of compliance at a re-examination, then the PHA may not delay initiation of termination or eviction proceedings for more than six months from the effective date of the re-examination, and the family's participation in the program must be terminated. PHA B adopts a different written exception policy. They provide that for any family with an elderly family member or a family member with a disability, if that family is found to be out of compliance with the asset limitation at re-examination, the PHA will provide the family a cure period of six months in which to cure non-compliance. Whereas PHA A adopted an exception policy that applied total non-enforcement to members of the exception category, PHA B is adopting an exception policy that applies a limited enforcement policy to members of the exception category. Alongside this exception policy, PHA B could adopt a limited enforcement policy for all other families with a shorter cure period than is provided to members of the exception category. They could adopt, for instance, 
a policy that provides all other families a cure period of four months. Alternatively, they could adopt an enforcement policy for all other families. To reiterate what was said before though, all exception policies must comply with civil rights and fair housing statutes and requirements. Having laid out what constitutes a limited enforcement policy or an exception policy and a cure period they create, let's now discuss how families might cure and what actions PHAs need to take when families do cure. First, if the family is found out of compliance with the asset limitation because their net family assets exceed $100,000 as adjusted for inflation, and not because of any present ownership interest in real property, curing noncompliance requires that they reduce the total value of their net family assets. Reducing the total value of net family assets is complicated by a provision at 24 CFR 5603 concerning any assets that are disposed of for less than fair market value, and I quote, in determining net family assets, PHAs or owners as applicable must include the value of any business or family assets disposed of by an applicant or tenant for less than fair market value, including a disposition in trust, but not in a foreclosure or bankruptcy sale during the two years preceding the date of application for the program or re-examination as applicable in excess of the consideration received therefore, end quote. One consequence of that provision is that families may not reduce their net family assets immediately by simply giving away their assets. For example, if a family brings their bank balance below $100,000 by giving a grandchild $20,000 in cash, that $20,000 will continue to be counted in the family's net family assets for two years. There are, however, several ways of reducing net family assets. For example, families might purchase items of necessary personal property or other goods that are excluded from net family assets. The family might purchase a vehicle used for daily transportation, and the PHA determines that such a vehicle should be classified as necessary personal property. In that case, their total net family assets will fall Moving funds into accounts that are excluded from net family assets may also be a means of reducing the total value of net family assets. For example, the definition of net family assets at 24 CFR 5603 holds that the following is excluded. Quote, the value of any account under a retirement plan recognized as such by the Internal Revenue Service, including individual retirement arrangements or IRAs, employer retirement plans, and retirement plans for self-employed individuals." End quote. Moving funds from a savings account to a retirement plan in the family's name would not count as a disposition for less than fair market value. Likewise, 5603 excludes irrevocable trust funds or trust funds that are not under the control of any family member it would not be considered disposing of an asset for less than fair market value to establish an irrevocable trust for the benefit of someone in the assisted family. If the family is instead found to be out of compliance because of a present ownership interest in real property, curing noncompliance requires removing the present ownership interest or demonstrating that the real property is no longer disqualifying. Disposing of the real property would remove the present ownership interest, though PHAs must bear in mind that disposition may affect the total net family assets. For example, if the family receives more for the real property after deducting reasonable costs incurred than its previously estimated cash value. If the real property is put up for sale, the property will qualify for the exemption at 24 CFR 5618 a12d, which would be sufficient to establish that the real property is for the time being exempt from the asset limitation. The property does not need to sell within the six-month period after re-examination 
but the PHA must seek verification that the family is offering the property for sale. The family may also demonstrate that the property now meets one of the other conditions exempting it from the asset limitation. If the family is out of compliance with the asset limitation, both because net family assets exceed $100,000 and because of disqualifying present uh, ownership interest in real property, then they must cure both conditions to be considered as having come back into compliance with the asset limitation. When a family demonstrates that they have cured non-compliance with the asset limitation, the PHA must record the curing of the family's ineligibility in the family's file. The PHA will not initiate termination or eviction proceedings for any family who has cured non-compliance. If the family is subsequently found out of compliance again at a future re-examination, the six-month clock would restart from the date of that second re-examination. The PHA is not always required and in some cases may not be permitted to conduct an interim re-examination of income when the family cures non-compliance. Refer to the PIH deep dive training on interim re-examinations for more information on the circumstances in which a family may receive an interim re-examination of income. Any changes to the family's income and assets that are the result of actions taken to cure non-compliance will be processed at the next annual or interim re-examination. To be clear, PHAs with a limited enforcement or exception policy must allow families to demonstrate that they have cured non-compliance during the cure period even if the family does not qualify for an interim re-examination of income. The point here is that if the family does not qualify for an interim, that only means that they will not receive a comprehensive review and update of their income calculation at that time. So far, we've provided an overview of the asset limitation itself a summary of the lack of PHA discretion at admission, a summary of the discretionary policies that PHAs may adopt for re-examinations, and a few notes on how families might cure non-compliance with the asset limitation. Now we're going to go into a little more detail about the two discrete requirements of the asset limitation. Let's first discuss the limit on permissible net family assets or the net family assets threshold above which a family will be out of compliance with the asset limitation. If an applicant family's net family assets are determined to exceed $100,000 as adjusted for inflation, they are ineligible for admission. If a participant family's net family assets exceed that amount and the PHA is enforcing the asset limitation at re-examination, then that participant family is out of compliance. This threshold, currently set at $100,000, will be adjusted annually in accordance with the Consumer Price Index for Urban Wage Earners and Clerical Workers, also known as the CPIW. The adjusted amount will be published on HUD user each August for the coming calendar year in the Annual Inflationary Adjustments and Passbook Rate dataset. PHAs must use the adjusted figure that is effective on the effective date of an income examination when they are checking whether the family is in compliance. Let's walk through a hypothetical example to get a sense of what that means. These figures are clearly stipulative just for the sake of example, because as of the time of this recording in January 2024, no inflation adjustment calculations have yet been made. The net family assets threshold for 2024 will be $100,000, and we do not yet know what the inflation adjusted threshold for 2025 will be. That said, for the sake of having an example, let's suppose that this summer in 2024, the appropriate inflation calculation is performed, and HUD determines that the net family assets threshold must be increased to $103,000 for calendar year 2025. Let's suppose further that 
come the summer of 2025, when HUD calculates the inflation adjustment for calendar year 2026, HUD determines that the net family assets threshold must be increased to $106,090 for calendar year 2026. That would reflect a consistent inflation of 3% per year. PHAs must use the HUD specified net family assets threshold, which they can find by looking for the appropriate level for the calendar year in which the income examination's effective date falls. For an income examination with an effective date of January 1, 2025, the PHA must use the calendar year 2025 net family assets threshold, which we supposed a moment ago was set at $103,000. A family with net family assets of $102,000 would be found to be in compliance with the asset limitation at the 1-1-2025 income examination. For an income examination with an effective date of January 1, 2026, the PHA must use the calendar year 2026 net family assets threshold, which we supposed a moment ago was set at $106,090. A family with net family assets of $105,000 would be found to be in compliance with the asset limitation at the 1-1-2026 income examination. Note that the PHA may need to begin a re-examination process for a January re-examination in the previous calendar year, so it is important to look at the effective date of the income examination when identifying the appropriate net family assets threshold. Bear in mind that this is only about net family assets. If the family has $800,000 in assets, but $750,000 of those assets are excluded from net family assets, the family is still in compliance with the asset limitation. PIH has another installment in our deep dive training series dedicated solely to the definition of net family assets, and that topic is extremely important for the asset limitation. HOTMA revises the definition of net family assets found at 24 CFR 5603 and the change in that definition could have an impact on whether your current participants will be found to exceed the net family assets threshold at their first income re-examination after you begin complying with HOTMA if you are indeed enforcing the asset limitation at re-examinations. Since another training on that topic is available, I will not go into further detail here, but just note in passing a few changes to the definition of net family assets that could be relevant. First, net family assets will now exclude the value of any retirement plan recognized as such by the IRS. Second, it will exclude educational savings accounts. And third, if the combined value of all non-necessary items of personal property does not exceed $50,000 as adjusted for inflation, the total value of non-necessary personal property will be excluded from net family assets. Consider how that might affect compliance. If the Simmons's family assets consisted of $40,000 in a savings account and a piece of commercial real property worth $65,000, then the total value of non-necessary personal property is just $40,000. So it is excluded from net family assets. The family's net family assets would then come to $65,000 and they would remain eligible for assistance. To close out this discussion of the net family assets threshold, let's take a look at two examples. In the first example, we're going to look at a family that has over $100,000 in net family assets and so will be determined ineligible. The Mustaine family is applying for public housing in January of 2024. Accordingly, the relevant threshold will be $100,000. The Mustaines have $10,000 in a checking account, $80,000 in a savings account, $15,000 in stocks, and $10,000 in a 529 college savings plan. The 529 plan is excluded from net family assets. 
The other items all qualify as non-necessary personal property, and their combined value is $105,000. That must all be included in net family assets. So the family's net family assets are in excess of what is permitted by the asset limitation. The PHA may not admit the mistakes. For our second example, let's take a family whose net family assets will fall under the threshold. In the same month as the Mustaines, the Osborne family is applying for the Housing Choice Voucher Program, so the relevant net family assets threshold is $100,000. The Osbornes have $10,000 in a checking account, $50,000 in a savings account, $80,000 in a 401k, and $10,000 in a 529 plan. The 529 plan is excluded from net family assets. The 401k is determined to be a retirement plan recognized as such by the IRS, so it is also excluded from net family assets. The checking and savings accounts are determined to be non-necessary personal property with a combined value of $60,000, so they are included in net family assets. The Osbornes accordingly have $60,000 in net family assets. The Osbornes are in compliance with the asset limitation, so the PHA is not prohibited from admitting them on asset limitation grounds. The second component of the asset limitation, you will recall, deals with real property ownership. And now we will turn our attention to that part of the asset limitation. Families are out of compliance with the asset limitation if they have a present ownership interest in, a legal right to reside in, and the effective legal authority to sell based on laws of the state or locality in which a property is located, a property that is suitable for occupancy by the family as a residence. Again, for reference, this is found at 24 CFR 5618. What qualifies as real property depends on the definition of real property provided under state law. There can be some variation by state in what is classified as real property versus personal property, especially for questions like whether a manufactured or mobile home is considered real property. In order for real property ownership to render a family out of compliance with the asset limitation, then five criteria must be met. First, the property in question must not be subject to one of the four exemptions listed at 24 CFR 5618A12, which we will discuss momentarily. Second, the family must have a present ownership interest in the property. This requires less explanation than the others. Past ownership interest is not disqualifying. Third, the family must have the legal right to reside in the property. Fourth, the family must have the effective legal authority to sell the property. Finally, the property must be suitable for occupancy by the family as a residence. We will look at each of these elements in more detail to understand what they mean. Before we do so though, take note that PHAs may rely upon a self-certification from the family, stating that they do not have any present ownership interest in any real property as evidence that the family is in compliance with the real property component of the asset limitation. PHAs do not need to third party verify that the family does not own any real property in any jurisdiction. If, however, the family does have a present ownership interest in real property, the family may need to supply further evidence as appropriate to support a claim that this ownership interest is not disqualifying. First, let's examine the four exemptions specified in 24 CFR 5618A12. The real property restriction does not apply to any property for which the family is receiving assistance under 24 CFR 982.620 or under the home ownership option in 24 CFR Part 982. 
That means that if a family is receiving assistance to lease the lot on which an owned manufactured home is located, that manufactured home is not disqualifying. And if the family is receiving assistance through a homeownership voucher, that home is not disqualifying. As an aside, I would call your attention to changes in the definition of net family assets regarding the exclusion of equity in property assisted under the homeownership option. The new definition will simply exclude the equity in any property for which the family is receiving assistance under the homeownership option from net family assets. The second exemption is that the real property restriction does not apply to any property jointly owned by a family member and another individual who does not live with the family but who resides at the jointly owned property. Suppose the head of household of an applicant family jointly owns a home with her sister, but her sister lives in that home and they do not live together. In that case, the applicant family's ownership interest by itself is not disqualifying. The third exemption is that the real property restriction does not apply to any property owned by a family that includes a person who is a victim of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. If the victim is a minor and the victim's parent or guardian owns the property, an ownership interest in that property by itself is not disqualifying. Take particular note that when a family requests an exemption from the real property limitation on this basis, the PHA must accept self-certification and follow the confidentiality and documentation request requirements established at 24 CFR 5-2007. The fourth exemption is that the real property restriction does not apply to any property that the family is offering for sale. Such a claim must be supported by sufficient evidence from the family. Note that these exemptions are only related to determining whether the present ownership interest in real property by itself renders the family out of compliance with the asset limitation. They do not themselves indicate that such real property must be excluded from net family assets. When the family lacks the legal right to reside in a property that they have a present ownership interest in, a present ownership interest does not by itself render them out of compliance with the asset limitation. That could be the case, for instance, if they owned a convenience store that was zoned so as to prohibit them from living in the property. When the family lacks the effective legal authority to sell the real property, a present ownership interest in it does not by itself render them out of compliance with the asset limitation. That could happen when, for example, the family owns heirs' property that cannot be sold until all fractional owners' claims have been settled, or when a family is going through divorce proceedings and has been forbidden from selling the property until the conclusion of that process. Note that the definition of net family assets in 24 CFR 5603 explicitly excludes the value of real property that the family does not have the effective legal authority to sell. So in this particular instance, such real property would also be excluded from the calculation of net family assets. The final criterion we need to examine here is suitability for occupancy by the family as a residence. When a property is not suitable for occupancy as a residence by that particular family, a present ownership interest in it does not by itself render them out of compliance with the asset limitation. Note that per 24 CFR 5618A2, by default, owned real property will be considered suitable for occupancy. For a property to be considered unsuitable, the family must demonstrate that it meets at least one of five conditions. If the property is determined to be not suitable, then a present ownership interest in that property does not by itself render the family out of compliance with the asset limitation. First, a property is not suitable if it's not capable of meeting the disability-related needs of all members of the family. For example, 
if it does not meet the family's physical accessibility requirements. The documentary requirements to establish disability related needs must comply with applicable fair housing and civil rights requirements. Second, a property is not suitable if it's not sufficient for the size of the family. The PHA's occupancy standards may be used to adjudicate this. Third, a property is not suitable if it is geographically located so as to create a hardship for the family, as determined by the PHA. For example, the PHA may determine that the commute between the property and the family's work or school would constitute a hardship. Fourth, a property is not suitable if it is not safe to reside in. The regulation at 5618A24 is explicit that this applies when the property is not safe to reside in specifically because of the physical condition of the property. For example, if the physical condition poses a risk to the family's health and the conditions of the property cannot be easily remedied, it may be determined to be not suitable. Finally, a property is not suitable if the family lacks the legal right to reside in the property. Note that such properties are already not disqualifying, so this is duplicative. The asset limitation only prohibits a present ownership interest in property for which the family has a legal right to reside in. This has already been alluded to, but if the family contends that the real property for which they have a present ownership interest does not render them out of compliance, they must provide sufficient evidence that it qualifies for an exemption, that they lack the legal right to reside in it or the effective legal authority to sell it or to the property's unsuitability. What constitutes sufficient evidence may be situation specific. However, remember that when a family requests an exemption because the family includes a person who is a victim of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, the PHA must accept self-certification and follow the confidentiality and documentation request requirements at 24 CFR 5, 2007. To review, let's quickly consider five examples. These examples do not specify the evidentiary standards that PHAs must use, but rather provide examples of how a PHA may choose to make determinations like these. First, the Barnes family owns a home, but they have put it up for sale. They provide the current MLS listing to show it is up for sale. The PHA determines that the present ownership interest in this real property does not itself render the family out of compliance. Second, Mr. Lennon has an ownership interest in a home, but he is currently going through a divorce and the court has instructed him not to sell it until the completion of that process. He provides paperwork from the proceedings as evidence. He lacks the effective legal authority to sell the property. Third, the Taylors own an older two-story home, but they need an accessible unit that has features for individuals with mobility-related disabilities. The PHA determines that their home is not suitable for occupancy by the Taylors as a residence. Fourth, the Smiths live and work in Chicago and they have two children in Chicago public schools, but they own a house in Rockford. The PHA determines that the geographic location of the house would constitute a hardship for the family. So mere ownership of the real property does not render them out of compliance with the asset limitation. Fifth, the Wallaces own a home that was severely damaged by a hurricane. While it would be legally permissible for them to live in it, the physical condition poses a health risk to them and the necessary repairs are cost prohibitive. The PHA determines that the home is not suitable for the Wallaces to occupy, so mere ownership does not render them out of compliance. Finally, it is worth underscoring that ownership of real property may render an individual out of compliance with the asset limitation in one of two ways. We've been enumerating reasons why a present ownership interest in real property 
does not by itself render a family out of compliance per 24 CFR 5618A12. However, when a property is identified as not suitable for occupancy, it's determined that the family or the property qualifies for an exemption at 5618A12, or the family lacks the legal right to reside in a property, that alone does not exclude the real property from the calculation of net family assets. PHAs need to separately determine whether the real property is part of net family assets. 24 CFR 5603 does exclude from net family assets the value of real property that the family does not have the effective legal authority to sell. In many other cases, however, real property may still be included in net family assets. In those cases, the value of that real property may contribute to the family's net family assets exceeding $100,000, in which case they would be determined to be out of compliance on the basis of 24 CFR 5618A11. In the fourth example a moment ago, we discussed a family whose real property was determined not suitable because its geographical location was determined to constitute a hardship. Suppose that the family has $60,000 in non-necessary personal property that is included in net family assets. And the cash value of that house in Rockford is $75,000. And the house is included in net family assets. In that case, their net family assets exceed $100,000 and they are not eligible for admission, even though the house was not suitable for occupancy as a residence. Now that we have discussed the eligibility restriction based on net family assets and real property ownership, we can now turn to discussion of termination of assistance or where necessary because a family refuses to voluntarily leave a unit eviction. As already mentioned, for applicants, the PHA has no discretion. If a family does not meet the requirements of the asset limitation at admission, the PHA may not admit them. For participant families, PHAs have discretion whether they will enforce the asset limitation at income reexaminations. If they adopt a total non-enforcement policy at re-examination, the following material will not be relevant. If the PHA adopts an enforcement policy or a limited enforcement policy, however, they will need to consider this information. If the PHA has not adopted a non-enforcement policy or an exception policy, then the PHA must initiate termination or eviction proceedings within six months of the re-examination at which the family was determined out of compliance with the asset limitation. If the PHA adopted a limited enforcement policy, this is required if the family does not cure their non-compliance during the cure period. That does not mean that the proceedings must be completed within six months. HOTMA does not alter the requirement for notices, for example, lease termination notices, or grievance or hearing requirements for such proceedings. So the termination or eviction process may not be completed until weeks after the six month deadline. What it means to initiate termination or eviction proceedings for non-compliant families varies by program. In the Housing Choice Voucher Program, participants are subject to termination of assistance. There is no requirement that the unit owner initiate eviction because of non-compliance with the asset limitation. In public housing, participants are subject to both termination of tenancy and, if necessary, because a family refuses to voluntarily leave a unit to eviction. There is no general provision that allows public housing families to stay in the unit and pay an alternative rent in these circumstances. In the Section 8 project-based voucher program, participants are subject to termination of assistance. The PHA and unit owner may agree to remove the unit from the HAP contract. The unit would become unassisted and the owner could allow the family to stay and pay a market rent. If the owner refuses to remove the unit from the HAP contract, 
the owner must evict the family and could not enter into a new lease with the now ineligible family. In the Section 8 Moderate Rehabilitation Program, participants who are not compliant are no longer eligible for assistance. If the owner fails to have at least 90% of assisted units leased or available for leasing by eligible families, the PHA may reduce the number of units covered by the HAP contract. As we draw close to the end of this training, let's discuss the written asset limitation policy that PHAs need to adopt and include in an administrative plan or admissions and continued occupancy policy or ACOP document as applicable. PHAs should update policy documents to indicate that applicants who do not meet the requirements of the asset limitation may not be admitted. This policy should also indicate the general parameters that PHAs will use when determining whether real property ownership constitutes a geographic hardship. Such parameters may remain general. There is no requirement that the PHA set a minimum physical distance, which could unintentionally prevent the PHA from considering the specific circumstantial details a family faces. PHAs must also update policy documents to include a written policy on whether and how they will enforce the asset limitation at re-examination. If they are adopting a total non-enforcement policy at re-examination, such a written policy may be fairly short. If the PHA will be enforcing the asset limitation at re-examination, several further details need to be specified. The PHA should indicate in their policy when they will initiate termination or eviction proceedings after determining that a participant family is out of compliance. Remember that PHAs may delay for up to but no longer than six months from the effective date of the re-examination at which the family was determined to be out of compliance. This policy should also indicate general parameters that PHAs will use when determining whether real property ownership constitutes a geographic hardship. Let's close with a high level list of key takeaways on the asset limitation. First, remember that there are two criteria or parts to the asset limitation. Families are out of compliance if their net family assets exceed $100,000 as adjusted for inflation, or if they have a present ownership interest in legal right to reside in, and effective legal authority to sell a property that is suitable for occupancy by that family as a residence. Even when ownership of some property does not by itself disqualify the family, that does not automatically mean it's excluded from net family assets. Second, PHAs have no discretion when it comes to enforcing the asset limitation at admission. Applicants who do not meet the requirements of the asset limitation may not be admitted. Third, PHAs do have discretion when it comes to enforcing the asset limitation at re-examination. They may adopt a total non-enforcement policy, in which case PHAs do not need to terminate the tenancies of participant families who become out of compliance with the asset limitation after being admitted, or for that matter, any current participant families. They may alternatively enforce the asset limitation, adopt a limited enforcement policy that creates an opportunity to cure noncompliance, or adopt exception policies that apply a different policy to families in a defined exception category. Though remember that all exceptions must comply with civil rights and fair housing requirements. Finally, PHAs need to adopt a written policy in their administrative plan or ACOP as applicable that will identify their discretionary decisions and update their screening criteria as applicable. Thank you for taking this PIH deep dive training on the asset limitation introduced by HOTMA. You can find more information about the implementation of the asset limitation and other HOTMA policies in HUD's Supplemental Guidance Notice on the implementation of Sections 102 and 104 of HOTMA. If you have further questions about HOTMA requirements, you can contact HUD at hotmaquestions at hud.gov. Thank you.